Welcome to Centre Church. We hope you enjoyed this message, recorded live from our Burgess Hill campus. So the topic is real life, real faith, real God. And in this topic, I just knew that I was meant to share what I'm going to share this morning, because the reality of our faith sometimes is that we are in the firing line. And the topic today is on the next slide, um, faith in the firing line. I know that Shirley's been in the firing line. Many of us have. I had a very difficult year last year. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about that, some of the topics, some of the things that came up from that. And yeah, I, I loved what Tom said last week. It was a brilliant introduction to faith and how... Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And this is what the people in Hebrews 11 that he introduced last week were famous for. That great hall of fame, that great hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Um, Tom spoke quite a bit about Abraham. And um, he spoke about how Abraham stepped out to step in. Do you remember that? Yeah. And sometimes stepping out is really, really challenging, especially when you're hit with a trial. And so was Abraham. He was hit with tough stuff. Are we willing to be uncomfortable in our faith? Because actually, real faith does involve discomfort. I'm sorry. We live in a fallen world. We live in the real world. And it, it, can, it can be... Great, but there are times where it's uncomfortable. Tough stuff happens. It happens to all of us. If you haven't had any tough stuff happen to you, come and see me afterwards. I'd love to hear. Actually, that would be a great testimony, someone who hasn't had any tough stuff happen. (laughs) I don't know if that will be possible. Um, So we, we know in Hebrews 11, it talks about Abraham. He had a child when he was 100, and he moved on to a new place without knowing where he was going to be going, which Tom mentioned. Joseph, then, we hear about, he had a dream about his future and the um, influence that he was going to have in his future. And in that dream, he spoke with the eyes and the, the mouth of faith about something that was going to happen. And then he proceeded to have difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. He was wrongly accused. He was thrown out by his brothers, betrayed by his family, betrayed by his boss, put into prison, and all manner of things. Then we get David. David was overlooked, rejected by Saul. David was rejected by his own men. He was bereaved. He was, family members were were destroyed. So much happened. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego comes to mind. The story in Daniel. They stood up for their faith, and standing up for our faith can lead to persecution. This is something that is happening in many parts of the world. I'm not going to dwell on that topic today, but if If that happens, we need to be ready for it because it's a privilege and an honor to suffer for God in his, in that way, for being a Christian, for naming Jesus as your savior. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They stood out for what they believed. They were put in the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace was 10 times hotter than it would have been for anyone else. And guess what happened? There was another in the fire. They weren't alone in the fire. And this is where we need to be. We need to remember we're not alone in the fire. Today, as I speak about faith under fire, I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 30. I'm going to actually just talk a little bit about David. Um, I'm going to talk about all sorts of things and, and weave in a little bit of my own testimony from last year and my illness time and various other things. So we're going on to 1 Samuel 30, verse 6 to um, 8. No, more than that. 1 to 8, sorry. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. 
They had a taxi clag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam and of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. Um, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. Not surprising in some ways. But David found strength in the Lord his God. And as the New King James puts it, it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. We're going to come back to that a bit later because it's so important. David had been through all manner of things that were difficult. He'd had... Um, untold grief. He'd wept until he had no more strength to weep. Now, I've been through the fire in the last year. Um, As many of you know, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in June. And I remember that time. Um, The reality of it was painful. And this morning, I'm just going to bring some of the reality of our trials and our faith under fire. Because if our faith is under fire, what do we actually do? We've got to be able to have that strength to stand. And it takes a lot of guts to stand sometimes. I had a really tough time. I remember when I first was told, you've got cancer, Ruth. I remember going away. I didn't know what kind of cancer, how big, how uh, advanced it was. I just knew, you've got cancer. And I've had cancer before, 15 years ago. Some of you may remember. And I, I know that when that happens, it's not good news. And so my life was really, really on hold. And I remember thinking, am I going to die? This is second time round, not good. I might die. I remember in the night having, grappling with God. I didn't get much sleep. God, what am I doing in this? I I, I might die. What is going to happen to me? And God said, just said to me very quietly, not a audible voice, Ruth, do you trust me? And I said, yeah, of course I do. (laughs) I do. And then I felt the voice again. A bit like Peter, where Jesus says to him, do you really love me? Jesus said to me, do you really trust me? And I said, yeah, I do, Lord, I do. And third time round, Ruth, do you really trust me? Okay, Lord. Yeah, I think so. And, And he said, you know, what if you do die? Actually, what if you do die? Now, I'm not belittling grief, because in trials... Many of you will have been through untold grief from loss of a loved one, and I know that's tough, and I actually was thinking about my own loved ones if that happened to me. This was my biggest worry. But of course, God said to me, if you die, Ruth, where are you going? You love me. You know the scriptures. You know that death is not the end. And actually, to me, what what is the difference between life and death? You know, some people, it says in the scriptures how those who suffered for being a Christian in persecution, they loved not their lives unto death. Now, actually, that's a huge challenge for us. Are we prepared to go that far? Are we prepared to actually say, God, I I put my life totally on the line. My life is actually in your hands. And when God said to me, do you trust me? He meant, do you actually know what death is for a Christian. Do you actually know that for me, for you as a Christian, that means life? It actually means life. And that really excited me. Now, fast forward, I'm here today. I've got through treatment. I've been really uh, blessed in that um, 
we believe surgery was successful. We believe the treatment then afterwards was successful. I trust God because one of my grapplings was, God, you, I was seeing with the eyes of faith, God, you've called me to do certain things in my life. I know you've called me. There were several things in my life that I know I haven't done yet that he said, you're going to do, Ruth. I've called you to. I've put you in place to do this. Just like Abraham that Tom mentioned last week, stepping out to step in. And this is what God said to me. There is more for you, Ruth. You're not at the end. And even if you were, actually, it doesn't matter to me. But it does matter because he has got a job for me to do on this earth. And I knew that. And I put my trust in that and said, God, I trust you. Where are we at this morning? Maybe in this fallen world, you are facing trials of any kind. It could be like Shirley, like myself, health. It could be, it could be cost of living crisis. It could be relationship breakdown. It could be betrayal by someone. It could be any manner of things. There are many kinds of suffering and grief and trials. And, and, and some of them are to do with our actual faith being under fire because we are proclaiming Jesus. There are even people in this country who suffer for that. And um, I just want to give us a few little pointers as we talk about this difficult topic. It, I've struggled with preparing this because it is a difficult topic. <laughs> Suffering. Um, I think one thing to really bear in mind on the next slide is something that we don't always do. Acknowledge feelings in the situation. Acknowledging feelings is not a non-Christian thing to do. You know, I was brought up in the times where Christians couldn't say how they really felt. You know, you can't be depressed, you're a Christian. You can't have trials and you can't have problems actively in your life and be a Christian. Of course you can. This is a fallen world we live in. We were made by God with feelings. Our feelings are important. And if we ignore our feelings, we pay the cost. Um, there's a book out that's in the uh, secular world that I have uh, read called The Body Keeps the Score. And it, it's, it's true. If we do not acknowledge and deal with things properly, our bodies tell us. Our bodies tell us and our minds tell us. But our bodies. So David and his men wept until they had no more strength to weep. Do not put the plug on your feelings. Do not put the plug on tears. Because it says in the scripture, in the Psalms, I have kept all your tears in a bottle. God wants us to come to him with our tears. He wants us to express to him our emotions. It's okay to do that. It's okay. First, um, Psalm 42 talks about how deep calls to deep in the roar of the waterfalls. If you go to the Psalms, you'll see many, many instances where people are desperate, downcast. Psalm 40, why is my soul downcast? Why am I disturbed within? Ask yourself that and, and take some time. Take some time to... Hone, home in on your emotions. It's, it's okay to reflect on them. What's not okay? I'm going to bust a few bubbles and myths this morning about suffering because I think it's important that we also don't take on the viewpoint that um, if we allow ourselves to um, reflect on the pain of suffering, we're going to get too inward focused. Now, you know what? That is true. We can. We can. And we can become too feelings-led. Because it does say, remember, it does say walk by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. It doesn't say we walk by faith, not by feelings. You know, um, actually, it's true. We don't need to walk by our feelings. But we need to acknowledge that feelings are part of this. This is real life. God made our brains, our bodies, our minds in such a way that if it, someone said, if you don't feel it, you don't deal it or deal with it. And that's a well-known psychologist that said that. If you don't feel it, you don't deal it. I'm sorry to say, if you've been through something traumatic or difficult, 
you may well feel it. I certainly did last year. And actually, it's okay. It's okay. We need to acknowledge that another person that we're sitting next to or that we're journeying with in our life may be feeling these feelings. And we need to, as Christians, be there for people, recognize, help people, talk them through. I've had wonderful friends this last year who've said, Ruth, come on, let's chat about this. Let's meet every week, one friend said, and let's chat anything you want to talk about and your feelings. It's okay. I was offered a clinical psychologist to see. I said yes. Okay, let's just bust that myth as well. It's not bad to go and see a psychologist or a therapist or a counselor. It's not bad. You know, if that person, if a counselor is truly professional and truly trained, they will be respectful of your faith in the trial. I saw a psychologist. It helped me. I would recommend it. I work in the world of therapeutic, um, in the therapeutic world. It's a good thing. I've met many therapists who are not Christians, who are very, very respectful of Christians who come and who want to have therapy. It's good. And I'm not saying we should all end up in therapy. It can be quite fashionable. Okay, yes, in America, perhaps fashionable to all have a therapist. But actually, what is the shame in that? The second point is dealing with unforgiveness. And that's on the next slide. Um, I, I want to bust this myth, though. Because in the New Testament, people came to Jesus and they, this guy was blind. And... Um, it says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, in John 9, this is, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And we know that actually unforgiveness has untold consequences on our lives. But let's just get this straight. Sin does not cause us to suffer in the sense that sin isn't the only thing. It may be if you've got a health issue, um, if, you've, if someone's pointed at you and said, um, you've got cancer, what, what sins in your life? I mean, that's a terrible thing to, to point the finger at. But on the other hand, you know what? We do need to come before God, and we do need to ask him and acknowledge if there is anything un of unforgiveness in our hearts. Um, because it says in Mark 11, 25 and 26, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. And actually, forgiveness is a big deal as a Christian. Forgiving others is a really big deal. And we know that people who have had mental illnesses, there are many who psychologists will tell you, are wrapped up in some kind of illness because they haven't forgiven. And there is a direct correlation. Last year, another trial happened to me. Um, I won't go into detail, but a really major di disappointment happened to me regarding something that I'd worked extremely hard on for three years. I had a major disappointment. It was a massive blow. I actually was probably clinically depressed for a good month and I came to church probably put on a lovely smile don't we all and I'm sure you probably didn't notice but I was really 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 depressed and actually part of the root of that was unforgiveness somebody had misled me in this process and I was hopping mad with this person hopping mad and um, Robin will tell you how mad I was and I just had to come to God day by day to forgive him it was tough. I didn't want to forgive him. I was like, he did me an unjust deed. He, he, he misrepresented something to me. It made a big difference. I was hopping mad. But I had to come to that point of forgiveness. I had to come to that point also of letting out the emotion, as David did, weeping until he had no more tears. I did weep on that situation. It was not easy. It was another firing at my life that was so tough to face. But you know, 
if we do acknowledge it, if we do move on from the forgiving, for me that made a massive difference. The breakthrough came when I began to really forgive him. And, and sometimes there are people who we just struggle to forgive and they keep coming up a time and time and time again. And that will happen with some people who we constantly see who hurt us. That's human, but we do need to deal with it. The third one is, the third point on the next slide is, we need to walk by faith, not by sight. And, and Bill Johnson says something really good. He says, faith doesn't deny the existence of a problem. It just denies the problem a place of influence. Take that in for a moment. So we're allowed to have the existence of a problem. It's, it's, it exists. That's life. It exists. The problem exists. The problem comes when we give that problem a place of influence in our life. And one way to deal with that is to express those emotions, to forgive anyone that you need to forgive. And, and that's no small thing. I know that. I know that. Don't deny the existence of feelings. Walk by faith, not by sight. One of my favorite verses, again, it's going to come up on the screen, last year while I was ill. Um, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. This verse kept me going. And if you want to take a note of it, I recommend it because it keeps you going. Knowing this fact, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man, woman, is perishing, yet the inward person is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory is an eternal weight of glory. Now, look, I just want to bust the other myth that suffering is to do with um, many people have formed a doctrine around your suffering because it's to teach you something. Mm. Now, that's not, that's not right in the sense that God, our God, is a good God, we got to get that in our heads. Our God is a good God. Our God doesn't cause suffering. In the scriptures, it talks a lot about suffering. Many of the passages that people misinterpret are misinterpreted because they are actually really about people who are suffering for literally proclaiming the name of Jesus as Lord. But other types of suffering we have in this world are not because all suffering is, 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 is because we're in a fallen world. We're in a world where man sinned, woman sinned at the start. We were cast out of the Garden of Eden. That's a whole other sermon. But, um, you know, I'm just giving the picture that we are in a world that is fallen, that is broken. It's broken. This world is broken. As long as we're in this earth, we're in a broken earth. Suffering here isn't being caused by God because he thinks you need to learn something. You need to learn a lesson. How many parents said that to their kids? Who had that said to them when you were a child? You need to learn a lesson here. It's teaching you a lesson. And I do get tempted with my own kids to say the same thing. <laughs> when I watch them, I think, oh my goodness, what you've just done. You're going to learn a lesson through that. And it is true. They're going to learn from it. But I, as a parent... Do I cause that to make them learn the lesson? What father or mother would do that? What father or mother? No way. So going back to this verse, our light and momentary troubles are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Eternal weight of glory. Whatever you're going through that's happened to you, it's because it's it's not because of God. He hasn't caused it. He has, potentially he's allowed it, you could say. But this world is, is living on permission from God because of sin entering the world in the very start. Um, and so then it says, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. 
For these things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Tom spoke about that a lot last week, that we are, what we look at, we need to focus on the vision, the calling, the positive things that God has said in his word. And when I was sick, at the beginning there, when God said, do you really trust me? Do you really trust me? Do you really trust me? I was then reminded of the fact that he has certain things he's called me to, and he will fulfill what he called. And Jeremiah 29, 11, God's plans, it reassures us, God's plans for us are good, not to harm us. God's plans. The world may have other plans, but God has good plans. We are to walk in faith, and that is looking at things that we can't see. As this verse says, look at what is unseen. There were many, many nights during my time of illness. Things went in waves, really. I had surgery. I recovered from surgery. And during that time, I had many bad, bad times where it was like, am I ever going to recover from this? And then they slapped me with some medication, which is really tough to deal with. And then I went down again. And that time was really tough because I thought, like, I've recovered from surgery. You know you're going to recover from surgery. But when someone puts you on medication for five to ten years and you're feeling absolutely horrid on it, you're going, actually, I have no idea how I'm ever going to feel normal again. And then that feels better. Suddenly that's, that's subsided and you get put on radiotherapy and you go, okay, there's another challenge. So each of these challenges, I had this verse in my mind all the time. And thankfully, I also have it, a song. If anyone wants the song, I can send it to you later. Um, that this song, this has been made into a song. Uh, fantastic. I was playing it and playing it and playing it. And I, I was just gleaning from that. Such encouragement. I will not lose heart. These troubles are working for me an eternal weight of glory. Glory. God wants to work glory in our sufferings and our trials and our tribulations. God is going to bring glory, but we have to let him. We have to keep our eyes on the ball. That ball is him. We have to keep our eyes looking in faith, not what we can see. All I could see was my pain. All I could see was my fatigue. All I could see was hopelessness. But actually, I had to look above what I could see and I had to look at what I couldn't see, which is God working for his eternal glory. And then point number four, we hear that David, going back to that scripture, he strengthened himself in the Lord when he'd lost everything. He could have got bitter. It says each one was bitter because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Strengthen ourselves in the Lord. How do we do that? You know, it doesn't actually give us any tips in this passage. It doesn't really tell us. But I think we do know from David's life and the Psalms. David wrote many of the Psalms, didn't he? So we do know that the big tip was that he did express his feelings, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, Hebrews 11, which Tom and I have both mentioned, um, talks about the big wall of faith and the people that walked in that faith. And then in Hebrews 12, it starts with, therefore, because of those people who walked in faith, because we walk by faith, walk not by sight, because we walk on the things that are not seen, not the things that are seen. Because of that, therefore, if you see a therefore, look what it's there for. Since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, Abraham, Joseph, um, David, and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because of that cloud of witnesses, witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and laid down at the right hand of the Father. You know, our God, his son, Jesus, was sent. He suffered a terrible death. We are 
in capable hands if we fix our eyes on Jesus because he knows our weaknesses. He has suffered in all manner of ways. So, so fixing our eyes on Jesus, strengthening ourselves in the Lord. I'm just going to give four points for this. I believe that it starts with worship. It starts with worshiping him, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Sometimes you don't want to worship. And actually what kept me going in my tough times, what has always kept me going in my tough times is putting on some worship music. If you can't sing, it doesn't matter. You put on the worship music, and actually there have been days where I didn't even want to be bothered with that. Couldn't be bothered. Couldn't be bothered. But you make yourself do it. Worship. Review God's promises is the second one. What were your promises? What did God promise you? Look back over your life. It's good to write down any prophetic words you've had over your life. Over the years, I've written down a few. I write them down, and then I go back to them in my notebook. I keep a notebook. And then you can encourage yourself. That's a way of strengthening yourself in the Lord. Look back. Review God's promises over your life. Review the promises he gives generally in his word. If you haven't got particular ones you've been writing down in, in your life, look at his word. Pick up the book and read it. And the Psalms are particularly encouraging. Pick up the book. Encourage yourself. Remember his promises. Thirdly, set people around you who encourage you. I can't emphasize that enough. We are a body. Samantha mentioned earlier that many of the results of the survey we did do mention that this is a church where there's a sense of community and friendliness and belonging. And I realize that many of you are new to church and maybe haven't yet experienced quite that. But we need people around us. And sometimes we need to say, I need someone. Please, will you help me? Do not be afraid to ask. Set people around you. Isolation is a huge barrier to coping with trials and fire, being in, on the firing line. Isolation. And we can all isolate ourselves. Actually, the easiest thing to do ever is just to say, I'm not going to church today because I feel too rough. And if I put my makeup on, I might cover up how I look. But inside, I feel horrid. This is a way the enemy loves to discourage us and separate us. The enemy loves to isolate Christians. It is his biggest target, I believe. And then the fourth one is put the armor of God on. And I know we're not going to preach and speak about that today, but you know Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. And, and when there are days where I haven't felt like I could do this for myself, I had no strength in me, just reading Ephesians 6, read it through and go, read it out loud. There's power to reading things out loud. He has given me the belt of truth. It's funny that the belt of truth is the first thing on the list of armor. I wonder why. I believe it's because God wants us to know his truth about our situation, not our own truth. Our truth is warped very often. Our truth may be walking by sight, not by faith. God wants to put his truth in us. He wants us to look at him. Now, yeah, I just want to say a few more closing thoughts. I don't know if Tom wants to come up at this point. God doesn't want the fire to defeat you. He wants to use it to promote you. If you're in the firing line and there may be particular people here who really are resonating with this message today, we're going to have, myself and Robin are going to be up the front here ready to pray for people who need prayer this morning. If you want prayer, do not hesitate to come and be prayed for because you know what? This is an opportunity. It may feel like it's a setback, but it's an opportunity. It's not a setback. It's an opportunity. There's one more verse I want to read out, Romans 5, 1 to 5. It's on the screen in a minute. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith, by faith, into this grace in which we now stand. And Ephesians 6 talks about stand, doesn't it? We stand. We don't sit, cave in. We stand. We stand. 
And I've been around my house all this time, being ill sometimes, standing, walking around, reciting scripture or reading out a, a, a scripture. And I stand. I stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. You know what? Our sufferings can be a time of deep, deep ministering from the Holy Spirit. This is what my experience is. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character produces hope. There is hope in your suffering. Joseph said to his brothers when he had suffered immensely, you intended to harm me, but God intended it. But God, Shirley mentioned, but God intended it to accomplish good for the saving of many lives. Who knows what God has called you to do? Rise up, stand in your suffering. Do not let it defeat you. Reach out if you need help. This is hopefully a safe place. If you need help, we trust that you feel safe enough to reach out, ask for prayer, ask for support. And don't be afraid that God is on your side. He hasn't caused this. He has given you victory. And remember, Romans 8.28 says, All things, not some things, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for listening to this week's message. For any more information or to find out more of what we do as a church, you can contact us at info at centrechurch.uk or check out our website at www.centrechurch.uk. Okay.